our default is not to be standing still. Our default is to kind of be constantly adding. By really considering the the capabilities of the people that you're trying to serve, you that might reveal some things that could be subtracted. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Unleashed, the fastest hour on the internet, coming to you from the Road 55 studio in Edmonton, Alberta, where every episode we feature a different thought leader or best-selling author, all in the name of helping you become the best leader you can be. Our lives are getting busier as the demands for our time and attention continue to rise and it's making it harder and harder to make time for the things we value most. Today, we're talking about the science of subtraction, a non-obvious way to improve the quality of our lives. Lottie Klotz will share simple strategies for using subtraction to avoid stress and burnout and experience more joy and fulfillment. We'll also explore how subtraction can help your teams and companies. Now, my very special guest today is Lottie Klotz. Lottie is a professor of engineering systems and environment at the University of Virginia and is nationally recognized as one of the top 40 under 40 professors in the United States. His online courses have reached tens of thousands of listeners around the world. Klotz also advises influential decision makers that straddle academia and practice, working with the Departments of Energy and Homeland Security, the National Institutes of Health, and the World Bank. At the University of Virginia, he co-founded the Convergent Behavioral Science Initiative, which brings together scholars from the schools of engineering, architecture, policy, education, and business, as well as the College of Arts and Sciences, in order to engage and support dozens of faculty and students doing applied interdisciplinary research. Klotz has written for venues <clears throat> such as the Washington Post, Fast Company, HBR, The Daily Climate, Insider Higher Ed, and The Behavioral Scientist. His first scholarly book was Sustainably Through Soccer, An Unexpected Approach to Saving Our World. And his most recent book, of course, is Subtract, The Untapped Science of Less. Before his academic career, Klotz was a professional soccer player, and he was inducted into the Lafayette College Hall of Fame in 2016. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Lydie Klotz to Unleashed. Welcome, Lydie. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's great to be here. So I, I know we're not going to sort of talk about this book today, but I, at some point I would love to chat with you about what we can learn about the world from soccer. So you know, I thought that was a really, uh, a, a really interesting, uh, a really interesting uh, a title to say the least. Everything, yeah, you can learn everything about the world from soccer. Yeah, right on. Well, it's great to finally have you on. I know we've been talking for a while about finding a date for this, and uh, it's a, it's a conversation I was excited for. And uh, I, this whole notion of subtraction. Uh, really kind of threw me for a loop and this you know your book took all kinds of twists and turns and really has shifted my paradigm on, on a whole bunch of things and i'm even starting to see the world i think a little bit differently and, and i'm excited for the audience to kind of learn a little bit uh, about the research that you've done you know and i had to ask what was so compelling for you uh, that you just had to write this book in the first place yeah, I, I mean, it was the most useful thing I've ever found doing research. And I, you know, I like writing. I mean, to, I, I try to think of things to write, but this was a case where it's like, oh my goodness, I have to share this with the, with the world. And um, I, I think of it as, you know, this is a very basic way to make change, subtracting, and we're systematically overlooking it. And so it's like, people are missing out, I'm missing out, you're missing out. And so how can I, you know, kind of share it in a book format and then th through venues like this too, and uh, kind of help rearrange people's mental furniture a little bit so that they see more of the options they've been missing. Yeah. Can you take us back to the moment where you realized that you had uncovered something that was, because I think this is non-obvious. And so there must've been a moment in time where you're like, oh my goodness, I think I think I've just found something. I got to do some exploration. What what was that moment? Yeah, that was. Uh, I, if there's a single moment, it was definitely playing Legos with my son. I have a replica, so uh, he was three at the time, and we we're playing. It basically looked like this. We had a bridge that was not level, so it was crooked like this. I turned around to grab another block, of course, <laughs> solve this problem, add to the shorter column. Um, but by the time I had turned back around, my son had uh, had removed a block. And made the shorter bridge and um you know we did 
thousands of hours of research uh, since then, you know, studying this phenomenon. But what we found is very close to what happened to me in that moment, which is that my first thought of how to make this situation better, how to change this situation, how to improve this situation was to think, what can I add to it? And that's not necessarily a problem, but the problem was that I, I added and then moved on without ever considering subtraction. And this, you know, the bridge, it's pretty neutral. If you add or subtract, it's, it's about the same. Adding takes a little more resources, but you create a level bridge both ways. But we, in, in our experiments, we, we found that, you know, this, this happens even when subtracting is objectively the better answer. So that was, that was the moment that I think reflects the, the core thinking process that, is, um, that becomes problematic for us. So I wondered, Lydie, can you get into that a little bit more? Like, why, why is that our, our wiring or, or, or why are we conditioned to want to add before we subtract? Yeah, I mean, any, any of these behaviors, of course, have lots of overlapping reasons. Uh, and I think you could start to look at our biology, right? And, you know, what, what have, what's been helpful in us passing down our genes? And, of course, acquiring stuff has been useful, right? If you, if you stockpile food, you're more likely to survive through lean time. So that's a good adaptive behavior. That's a little obvious. The, the one that I was surprised um, that is not surprised that it's a factor, but surprised how biological it is, is competence. And this ties into, you know, when I think about me attending another meeting with my department that, you know, I'm doing that to display competence first and foremost. I want people to see that I'm effectively interacting with the, the organization. And for me to not go to the meeting, I wouldn't be displaying competence in as obvious a way. And this is something that has deep biological roots. And so the example I use in the book is bowerbirds. And these are the birds that build the ceremonial nests, right? So the, the male bowerbird will um, build an ornate nest. The female bowerbirds go look and see which nest they like, decide which male to mate with. And then the female bowerbirds go build a nest to shelter the young. So there's no, you know, shelter purpose to the male's nest. It just effectively with the world. And th that's a, a good trait to have when you're trying to, you know, match your genes. So um, we all share this desire to display competence and it, and research has shown that it extends not just from like physical stuff to task completion, right? And so when you think about all these things that sometimes you struggle to subtract, it's often because you're, you want to show competence, which is a very biological um, desire that we have. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So why is it so important that we should be all learning how to do a little bit more subtraction and like what, what's, what's in it for us as leaders, for example? <clears throat> well, I mean, in addition to it being just a, a basic way to make change, right? This is a tool that you want to have in your toolkit. I also think that it's been underused because of the, <laughs> because of the way that, you know, our, our brains think of adding first and then we add and move on. So not only that's why untapped is in the, in the title of my book. And it's like kind of unleashing subtraction, right? It's like, this is this thing that's, there's latent potential there because people haven't been using it. So I think that's the, um, that's the overarching reason why, uh, why we should think about it. Right. Yeah, this this whole notion of competencies really got me curious. I mean, it, are there are there ways that you can then still demonstrate benefit to your colleagues through subtraction because it's just so non-obvious and sometimes not even noticeable. And uh, this whole this whole idea that we add things to make ourselves stand out and seem smart, even without necessarily consciously realizing that. Yeah, no, that's a the perfect next question and certainly you can i mean it, it, the disadvantage in displaying competence through subtraction is that it's invisible um <clears throat> but i'll give you an example my friend ben he worked with me, us on this research for you know for two years of his life and um he came to me one day and said okay we installed this no bell and so this is this bell that they ring whenever they say no to a task. And what they're trying to do there is, you know, this is something that becomes invisible, but by ringing the bell, you're at least you're, you're making a noise, you're, the people around you are noticing, you're kind of making this note to yourself uh, that, that subtracting has, has made this thing better. So that's, you know, a playful way that they did it. I, I, you know, one quibble I have with that example is that it, 
a no, saying no isn't exactly subtracting. So Ben would say like, oh, I didn't, you know, my, my department chair asked me to be on this committee and I said no. And I'm like, that's great, Ben, but you didn't actually subtract anything. You just didn't add. Um, but I think uh, Ben's partner, Sophie, also a professor, she does even better. She, um, when she subtracts something, she leaves evidence of it. So uh, I'll stay with the meeting example because this is what she uses. But she, when she says no to a meeting or when she says, okay, I'm not going to go to this regular meeting anymore, she leaves it on her calendar. It's like, okay, this, this free, you know, high value time brought to you by this meeting that you subtracted a while ago. And that's at least, um, you know, she's showing competence to herself there. Uh, I think um, <clears throat> in terms of showing competence to other people, there's, it, sometimes it just takes more, right? And the iPhone's a good example here, right? No, everybody know, knew when the iPhone came out, they're like, wow, that is different. And you knew that it was different and better because it had been, all these extraneous features had been stripped away. But I, I would contend that in that case and in many other cases, if you just subtracted one thing, nobody would have noticed. But if you subtract a whole bunch of stuff, people notice. And you all, I think we all like kind of know this person, right? There's the, the, the person who is, uh, you know, their schedule is always like really flexible. They don't seem to have a lot, a lot of, you know, um, they seem to really prioritize their creativity and their, their free time and their thinking time. And everybody's just like, oh, wow, that person really has it together, right? And it's because they've subtracted a lot, enough to, to actually make it visible so that you can see the competence. Yeah, well, <clears throat> and you use the meeting example. Most of us can probably relate to those moments where a meeting gets canceled last minute and there's usually a sigh of relief that you've got some found time. Right. One of my, one of my concerns with reducing meeting time though is that one of the philosophies of effective meetings is that a, a good meeting should save you time. When you add up all of the informal conversations that you have about topics and sidebar conversations, as opposed to getting all the key decision makers in one room at the same time. So have you seen anything work or do you have any sort of guidance or advice, Lydie, for how to subtract in the right way so that subtraction actually doesn't become additive again? Right. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, it just sounds even um, weird. Like that just even sounds weird to say it. Like I might. I'm, I'm, no, I mean, we talked about this. <laughs> oh, it's what's so fun about like compliment combining the experiments with the thinking about the real world and in the experiments we're like oh are people just do we count it if they subtract in service of adding because that's that's one form of subtraction right it's like you take something away because it means that you can add a million things <laughs> somewhere else so so it's a, it's a fair question i mean bob sutton who's coming on in two weeks and i have been talking about this because he he's you know super interested in organizations and, and friction and uh, I mean, certainly there need, it's add and subtract, right? It's not that subtracting is always the right answer. It's just that we, we tend to not consider it and hopefully we'll consider it more. But it, he, we were talking about it with meetings and he was like, what if people just thought of it in terms of having everything? So cut the frequency in half. So go from two weeks, the weekly meetings to biweekly meetings, cut the number of attendees in half, cut the time in half. And see what happens, right? It's not that you have to permanently do that, but if if all of a sudden you're still getting that same benefit of like the time saving benefit from the meetings, and now the meetings are taking half as much time, half as much personnel, half as much uh, half half the frequency, then um, then you've gained something. So I think that's another. You don't. It doesn't have to be a permanent thing. You can also just try it out and and, and see what happens. But yeah, I totally yeah. agree. I mean, there's huge value in meetings and one, especially during the pandemic. I mean, our um, department chair was really great about, you know, kind of making people keep coming to meetings and in a nice way, but it was like, there's that, you know, I don't mean to say that all meetings are bad. Certainly there was a huge benefit to the morale of our little organizational unit because people stayed connected during that time. Yeah, I, I know we're, it's it, the meetings are uh, an easy example to draw on because we can all relate to that. And as we talk more about it, it, I'd have to wonder too if there's a relationship somehow, somehow between subtraction and discipline and commitment. Because I know one of the concerns is if if you were to cut your meetings in half in terms of frequency and went from weekly to biweekly, 
meeting a, missing a meeting under that under that uh, uh, context would mean that you're having maybe gaps of a month between getting together. But I wonder if it actually galvanizes commitment so that you would never really miss a meeting as opposed to if the frequency is higher, you think, well, if I miss this one this week, it's not that big of a deal. So you know, you do have me curious if there is a relationship there. And I wonder if you've ever thought about that or if you've sort of experienced anything similar. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just, you know, the the more scarce something is, the more kind of value you place on it, right? Um, and so if this is the only opportunity to have these interactions in the case of a meeting, then you could you could see that being the case where people actually put more priority, maybe prepare even more for the meetings. Um, so so yeah, I could I could see that happening. Again, this is not like a always this is going to be the case, but you could certainly see that that being the case very often. I think that, you know, thinking about my organization, I think that would certainly be the case. And I thought you were going to go with discipline to like, oh, are people still going to come? But I, I, it's, I think you're exactly right that the, the, the problem we have is not motivating people and making sure that they're actually doing work. It's, it's, it's helping them kind of be most effective in, in the work that they do. Um, and so that, uh, that kind of, um, that kind of approach could be really helpful for for these highly motivated people that I think is pretty much everyone we're talking to today. Yeah, Lydie, I wonder if you had some examples that that you have seen because I mean you you study teams and organizations and and you know not not just corporately but but all in all kinds of um, in all kinds of disciplines and I wonder if there are some really significant gains that you have seen from <clears throat> organizations that have very intentionally started to apply a subtraction mindset. Yeah, I, I don't want to steal Bob's thunder, but you should ask him about the AstraZeneca case study. So what they did, um, they're a pharmaceutical company, and we love the case study because, you know, their core thing is research. And uh, and they they challenged their employees, uh, 60,000 employees, I think, to free up time for research. And they, they calculated they've saved about 2 million hours. Um, from from the things that the, their employees came up with and it's you know everything from small things to um kind of you can't send an email over 250 words to to bigger things like the the cutting of of meetings and, and things like that so that's one example um another one uh, consulting company that i worked with thought about you know kind of making rules right um so one of the reasons we don't subtract is because we don't think of it um, we also, there's this competence, right? We want to display competence, but if you make it a rule that you have to subtract, then people can display competence by subtracting. And so um, something as simple as like, okay, if you're going to bring a new policy that we should use, also come with two that are already on the books that you think we don't need anymore, right? And this kind of helps you keep your system in balance. And this, um, from my one of the stories I heard is that I haven't verified this, but the British Columbia did this with their legislation, where they said like a legislator, if they came with a new law, had to come with two that were on the books that they would want to get rid of. And if you know the growth of laws is faster than the growth of anything um, over the last seventy years, and so but this that, a rule like that would kind of keep um, keep subtraction top of mind, also allow you to display competence by subtracting, and I think can. Ha, it works at the organizational level as well as at the kind of provincial level. I love that tip, <clears throat> having to subtract two things before you can add something. I think that's uh, that's got I think that's got some merit and that's got some legs to it. The the law example, like I can't help but think about how that might help solve um, or at least progress some important social issues caused by some of the systemic challenges that we're facing too, which is uh, which is also an interesting topic. So I, I think you've sold us on, uh, on the benefits of, of having a subtraction mindset more often, Lydie. What are some ways that a person can actually start to maybe apply some of this thinking in addition to some of the examples that you've already shared? Yeah, I think that the, um, uh, so the, one of the problems is that we don't think of it, right? And so it's like, okay, watch this episode and you'll think of it more and listen to the audiobook or read the book and you'll hopefully rearrange your mental furniture and think of it more but also you're thinking about it right now right so how can you build this into your processes um so an example here i'll use a personal one i ever i do a to-do list not as often as i should but you know weekly or monthly i'll sit down and be like okay here's here are my priorities here's what i'm gonna do and i inevitably think of new things that i want to do 
And now I force myself to also consider stop doings at the same time. And, you know, it's hard. It's hard to come up with, uh, th I find myself kind of reframing to do's as stop doings, right? So it's like, I want to improve my posture. I'm going to, so I frame that as like, stop slouching. Um, but it does, thinking of it does force me to think of things that I can do to relieve my schedule. And so that's an example of putting in place like a process reminder that makes it so you can't go past this step without considering this option. And that's the, you know, that addresses the core problem. And you could think about that in terms of a stop doing also in terms of stop thinkings. I mean, I think that it's so amazing to be able to get the, this um, information in the form of podcasts and like there's a podcast for everything. Uh, but do we actually spend the time to, uh, you know, kind of on a, a weekly or yeah, ideally on a weekly basis, think about the things that we think, right? It's like, okay, here's my mental model. Are there things that I no longer believe are true or there are things that I you know no longer think are as important for me um, and so again like that you're, you're building that into the process rather than relying on yourself to think of it in the moment um, and I the last I, I we like to think of this along the lines of like social stuff like meetings um, thinking you know the mental stuff and then also the uh, physical things and I think for for physical things you can also make rules right if I in my house if we Every time a new Amazon box comes in, if you have to like get rid of something of the equal size, that kind of keeps your keeps your system in balance. It's hard with kids, but it's um, it's it's an example yeah. of building it into the process. Yeah, I can appreciate that. You, know, you, you talk a little bit in your book as well that the the reality of subtracting is it often takes more time to do it. So you've <clears throat> you've, you've built something, and if you're going to go that next step to find a way to refine it and subtract things from it, that is going to add time to your schedule in a lot of cases, not, not remove it. And so it, how do you want, how do you sort of determine what activities are worth spending the extra time to find ways to subtract from versus the others that may not be as, as beneficial to invest that time? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Um, yeah. First, I mean, I think we've got to get past that, it's easy to have this misconception that, you know, less is less work because it, it's more thinking and it's more process steps, right? To subtract something from your organization, to subtract meetings, you have to have added meetings in the first place. Um, and there is another form of less, which is just not doing anything, which is appropriate sometimes. But what we're talking about is the less, like kind of on the other side of more. And then the, that second half of the question, how do you decide where to keep going? I think it's uh, my first reaction would be in the important stuff, right? Because, you know, what I go back to the Lego example. I mean, when I added, I basically solved the problem that was good enough. And it's a trivial problem. Legos, it's now level. I can move on and spend time with something, uh, something else in my life. And I, I think it's the, the really important stuff where you want to think about subtracting, right? So it's, uh, you know, if I'm, I'm writing, a book that's gonna be read by you know more people than have ever read anything I've I've written. I want to make sure that I'm editing and, and taking the extra time to not just do a good enough job, but kind of do a a perfect job. So I would say that it's in like in the in the highest value stuff. That's where you want to spend the time to do the subtraction to make it perfect and, or not perfect, but beyond just good enough. Um, and that that's also Sorry, one more point on that, but that's also hard, right? Because if I think about the things that you care about the most can sometimes be the hardest things to subtract from. Absolutely. Now, I, I have to wonder that it's okay. It's getting harder to find a competitive advantage as, 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 um, as a company. The world is becoming more unpredictable. It's changing more often. I wonder if this mindset of subtraction could be a, a new frontier of competitive advantage because, I mean, removing friction is not a new concept, right? So lots of innovation comes from finding ways to, to simplify and remove friction. But if, even with that said, if, if the mindset is still to add and not subtract, it sounds like most companies are not really applying that logic to try find competitive advantage. I wonder if you have some commentary on that. 
Yeah, no, I think the friction is a perfect example of that point you made earlier about, you know, subtract, subtracting in the service of adding, right? Because so much of removing friction is about, oh, if we remove the friction, then our thing's got to go like a million miles an hour and explode and, and be really fast. Um, and it's not like, uh, you know, one of the things that Bob talks about that I love is that sometimes something going slow is good too. Um, I would say, uh, I'm going to start with like the theoretical piece because, um, and then we'll talk about how it might lead itself, to lend itself to practical examples. But you, just from like a systems theory perspective, um, whether it's a social system, whether it's a physical system, certainly like if you can do the same thing with fewer parts, it's a more, uh, it's a, it's a better system, right? It's a more effective system. It's a more adaptable system. There are more options. You, you, there are more ways that somebody can take that system and, and change it to make it better. Um, and I think, uh, I'm trying to think of the best, um, best example of this. So, uh, well, Kurt, I mean, so I'll start with the people who talk about it in social systems. So Kurt, Kurt Lewin is a, like the founder of social psychology, and um, he was really interested in social psychology, not for the kind of core thinking processes, but how to use this to change the world. And his argument was that there were two, two ways to make change. One was good and one wasn't as good. And the, the not as good way was to add incentives, right? Add forces pushing you in the direction that you want to go. And his... Um, his his good way to make change was to remove barriers, right? And and the reason that removing barriers is helpful is because it uh, it relieves tension. So if you if you just add incentives, you're still fighting against the tension that's kind of holding you back in the system. And this I'll use a parenting example. When I give my son a tell my son he can have a cookie if he doesn't watch TV at dinner, you know that might make him happy and overcome his desire to watch TV at dinner, but it doesn't remove the friction of like him wanting to watch TV at dinner. So if it, if it backfires and he doesn't get the cookie or TV, uh, he's going to be twice as disappointed. But if you somehow distract him, it's, it's hard now that he's seven, but um, it works on the three-year-old. If you move the, the iPad out of the, out of the situation, she doesn't even think about it. And then, you know, you've relieved the tension in the system. So I do think that there's certainly a you know competitive sustainability advantage there too, right? It's like you 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 can last longer if you have um, fewer of these these parts and, and things that can go wrong. Yeah, that really, I don't know. it reminds yeah. me of some of the stuff yeah. that James Clear has done on uh, <clears throat> author of Atomic Habits on just how important the environment yeah. is for being able to stick with something that is important and removing non-essential things. I mean, I think a social media as an example uh, removing those apps off your phone is a pretty effective strategy mm -hmm. to reduce social media time as as a, opposed to as you're suggesting try to give yourself an incentive or some kind of a reward so that's that's fascinating you know lady the, the other thing that I, I think is really becoming clear is the impact of subtraction when it comes to communication and there's when i like on twitter yeah. as an example one of the one of the themes that has emerged i would say in the last six to 12 months is people are um, quickly gaining mass audience and attention for writing simple threads, really complex, uh, um, really complex ideas and distilling them down into the essence. And to do a really good job of writing one of these Twitter threads, you've got to write quite a bit and then you've got to remove a whole bunch of filler and non-essential information. And the ones that are simplest and more to the point that are covering topics that are relevant to a large enough audience those are the ones that are going viral. And I mean, this is almost happening on a daily basis now. And uh, so there's, there's some really good evidence uh, in terms of the power and the impact of, uh, uh, of subtraction uh, for sure. Yeah, no, that's uh, like Adam Grant's stuff recently on Twitter. I mean, he's been doing some of those and you think, oh man, Adam's just brilliant, which he is, but it's also like, exactly like you said, there's all this time and, and work that went into it and you don't see the subtraction. You don't see the, the edited pieces, you just see this really clear, apparently simple, but also very profound uh, thing that is ends up being very, very helpful for people. Yeah, absolutely. And and what's in it for me is such an important question. And uh, so, what's in it for the audience, I think, as leaders, if we can if we can get better, even just with communication, as an example, whether it's verbal, written, uh, how it how it shows up in our presentations applying some uh, some of these laws of uh, of subtraction 
will only help you make your point and increase your influence and get the outcomes that you're that, that you're uh, aspiring to. So I think that's really fascinating. Uh, uh, Lydie, I'd like to talk about loss aversion a little bit and yeah, just uh, just to, you know really quickly for the audience, the, you know the the. The, the science around loss aversion is that human beings are more motivated to keep what we have versus earn something in, a, in addition. And, and Lydie, if I've butchered that, please correct me. But uh, what I was more interested in, though, is how much does loss aversion interfere with subtracting? And how can we perhaps become a little bit better at not being so tied to the effects of, of it? Yeah. I mean, so loss aversion is that we don't like losing things. And, and it's not just that we don't like it, but it's, we don't like it more than we like gaining something the same value. Um, now, the reason the most straightforward way to steer around that with subtraction is uh, all of our examples with subtracting have not been losses, right? They've been we're trying to make the situation better. By definition, we're subtracting to improve something. So the end situation is not a loss, but that does require some subtracting in there. Uh, and, and if you just focus, you know, if I just focused on the Lego block, I feel like, oh man, I lost the, the small block. But, you know, if you focus on, I gained the bridge, um, then loss aversion shouldn't kick in. So the, so the one thing is to, to really think about the end state, not the, um, not the in-betweens. And, you know, Marie Kondo, we haven't brought her up, but since you just brought up Kahneman and a Nobel Prize winner, we'll bring up the, the tidying maven Marie Kondo, who you know, she gets people to declutter their homes, but she doesn't, you know, she, she doesn't focus on the stuff that they're giving away. She focuses on, she has them focus on the, the end state, right? It's like, if you listen to me, you will have this beautiful, clean living space that's going to, you know, spark joy. And um, that's something that we all can learn from because it is going to require these immediate subtractions. And if you focus on the, the individual meeting or the, or the, you know, the, t-shirt that you never wear but is in your closet anyway you're gonna feel loss aversion but if you focus on the you know the end state that's actually better then hopefully loss aversion won't kick in right so focus more yeah that's good focus on the gain and not the loss so there's a, there's a little bit of mental gymnastics and having to convince yourself there that yeah it's hard and it's um yeah and it requires yeah but i think uh you know really visualizing it is important you know so kondo she's like adam grant but in that she's like okay her stuff seems really simple but she she's really careful in saying envision this destination right envision where you're going to be and i think you know with back to the meetings and organizations it's like do we have we really spent enough time thinking like oh what could our work week look like if it was stripped of half of these redundant tasks and i would argue that we probably haven't spent enough time kind of visualizing that and like letting it seep into our brain so that we can really imagine the that better end state. Yeah, I could appreciate that somebody reads your book, gets really excited and, and uh, really starts to embrace this science of subtraction and applies it a little bit personally. And then as we do, as we get excited about things ourselves, we try to then get our colleagues and our teams to apply the same things that we're excited about. And I could see there being some resistance to this. Are there some ways that you have seen be really effective at trying to convince your colleagues to get on board with this mindset of subtraction? Yeah, don't call it subtraction. Uh, first of all, <laughs> call, um, because I mean, I used it purposely as the title of the book, but I, you know, it's a, I mean, words have what they call valences, which is like how people feel when they encounter this word, basically. And most, most word valences are pretty neutral, but subtraction has a has a negative valence uh, you know so people think about this it immediately is kind of eh, i don't i don't know if i like that it's not quite as bad as moist but it's uh it's not a uh, it's not positive so if you can frame it as like you know um essentialism you know like greg mckeown mckeown's uh framing or you know frame it as decluttering or, or cleaning or you know condo reframes right she talks about the the life-changing magic and sparking joy you know so trying to yeah. trying to frame it in terms of again what you're gaining but also using like more positive 
positive words for it. And eventually, you know, we'll we'll uh, start to subtract or continue the subtracting movement and, and totally change the valence around the word. But until then, you know, maybe try some different language. Yeah, yeah. What about customers? Like, we I think we probably a lot of us had this experience experience where uh, this the price of the hamburger is the same, but it's smaller. <laughs> or you know, yeah. who wants to pay yeah. the same price for a ninety-page book? Uh, uh, as they pay for a 200 page book how do right. we how do we get consumers to see the advantages of subtraction yeah i got asked this i was talking in switzerland last week and got asked this question and i was like oh man i wish i had thought of this answer on the spot but it's like we're good at getting selling value right i mean we can sell a lot of things um you know even things that are bad for people right it's like you're able to sell cigarettes you're able to sell alcohol you're able to sell food that makes people unhealthy um so i think part of it is like okay just really tapping back into what that value proposition is for the human and then um and then you can figure out ways to sell it um and i but I, I mean, I fully acknowledge that you're, you're, you are battling this mindset. It's like, why would I pay? Um, an example I use in the book is my house. Uh, it's like, why would I pay more for a 1500 square foot house than for a 2500 square foot house? Um, so I don't But again, I think tying it back, I saw in the comments, even like this notion of lean and customer value, right? It's like tying it back into what that customer value is really honing in on what that is, and then let the marketing geniuses take off with that, because there, there is a value to this kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. It, you make some references to flow as well. And uh, yeah, we all, we, we should also be a lot, so lucky as to be able to spend a considerable amount of time in flow just in that state of euphoria, we're working on meaningful projects and time just seems to, uh, to evaporate and, and we're really in our zone of genius. What does subtraction have to do with flow? My argument is that I think subtraction can often bring a flow state. And you know, I think about this in terms of editing, right? So when I'm, when I'm working on writing something or creating something, when, you're, when you have a blank piece of paper, you know, that's one type of activity. And, and that's where you can get writer's block, right? It's like, oh my gosh, there, the possibilities are endless. What do I, what do I put here? Um, and then, you know, when you start having ideas, it's great. And it, you know, it starts to roll a little bit, but also once you've got that first draft of something, right? Once you've got the, and you know, it could be a first draft, it could be, you know, where your organization currently is, then the subtractions are like, they're all within reach, right? So they're, um, uh, the words are right there. I just have to figure out how to rearrange them. And that's why, like, I feel like hours can just disappear when I'm, when I'm editing, because it's like, okay, this is a, a problem. It's a manageable problem. It's working me. It's I'm at the limits of my abilities. Like I need to think and, and figure out how this sentence is going to come across the, the best way. Um, but it's not like, uh, it, it's not, I don't, I don't have to worry about writer's block anymore. So that's where I think that it can put you in this experience of flow. And, you know, even just going back to the very basic level of it's more thinking, it's more work. I mean, we're, we're all people who enjoy that, right? You get, you derive value and it's, you know, the, we all do the work we do, I think, because we, we like it and we see value in it. So um, to the extent that subtraction takes more work, but it's like work towards the, the things that we really care about, um, that kind of keeps us in that zone of flow or like optimal experience um, as well. Yeah. And if, if it's true that there's at least a strong correlation between subtraction and flow, then uh, we have to subtract to make a bigger impact on the world. And I think that's a pretty compelling reason to start to uh, pay attention for opportunities to, uh, for subtraction uh, without a doubt. Uh, Lydie, I was yeah. reminded, uh, I was reminded uh, yesterday, uh, it was the the two year anniversary in Canada of us going into significant COVID restrictions and kind of you know basically the whole uh, the whole world uh, for all intents and purposes shut down at that point. And you know, I, I couldn't help but wonder for you. I mean, you might, you're you're just so um, predisposed now and conditioned to look for opportunities and, and examples of subtraction. And I wonder if you have some thoughts on how COVID 
affected subtraction? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, so what the research shows and, you know, what if you're being honest with yourself and reflecting, it's like our default is not to be standing still. Our default is to kind of be constantly adding. And what, you know, what we're talking about with COVID and is that it was this massive interruption to the default, right? Uh, and it was like all this, everything was thrown up in the air. All You rethought every single thing about your, about your daily schedule. And so it's an, it's a one of a once in a lifetime opportunity for change. Um, and I think, you know, for me, it showed me when, you know, after you're being in six months of this way of doing things and some of the things that I haven't been able to do and you realize that, oh, geez, like for me, work travel, um, we spend a lot of time like flying around and meeting other professors and talking to a a department and um, I mean and it's useful it's not like it's totally useless but it's not as useful I found as like okay reaching out to the professors I really wanted to interact with having a zoom call which would take an hour instead of half of a week and um, and and doing it that way so basically what happened is it kind of shook me out of my general routine and showed me some potential stop doings and it's kind of like going back to the meeting example we started with right it's like it's not that you have to get rid of these things forever, but try it. And the pandemic forced us to, to try some things. And then I think it'll be a shame if we just kind of unthinkingly add everything back. And I, I certainly, you know, last night was one of the first in-person classes that I've had where students are talking and awesome, amazing in-person conversation. I'm so glad things like that are coming back. But um, I think we want to be careful of just kind of unthinkingly adding other things back. Yeah, and I, I don't know if this is true anymore, but I, I certainly know that one of the patterns early on in, uh, in the pandemic, and I'll, do, I'll just say the first, the, the first six months, most organizations, including ourselves, that, that we were in contact with, uh, definitely, without knowing it, subtracted and simplified their strategy, but intensified their schedules. And I find that inverse oh, relationship... Yeah. And I, when I, and I don't, I don't necessarily have a question about it, Lydie, but it's just an observation that right, is just sort of risen to the surface for me as I was hearing you talk a little bit. And, you know, I, I know part of that was we were fighting for survival. And, you know, when you're fighting for survival, I think it, you know, it, it triggers the fight or flight. And, and on the one hand, it caused a ton of focus to say, hey, look, we, we only, there's only two things that we want to be doing here. This is the essential two things, and we need everybody to focus on them. And yet, even though the world had sort of shut down and there might not have been as much, uh, as much to do as there normally is, we were spending more time on fewer things. And, you know, I, I don't know what resonates with you about what I've said there, but I would be interested if you have any comments on that at all. Oh, the, I mean, it's fascinating to hear of that example from your world. I mean, I think that intense focus resonates tremendously with me, right? Because I'm, I, my situation was, you know, top 1% of globally of how we experienced the pandemic, but we had a three-year-old, you know, our two little kids at home, two parents working, trying to continue doing the jobs. And it, exactly that, it's like the intense focus. Okay, what matters here? Like, I've, I've got to do triage on my daily activities and figure out, okay, this is, this book has to keep going. Uh, I've got to stop doing this committee that I'm on. Um, and um, so, so yeah, that intense focus is really, um, uh, really resonates. And also something that I've tried to keep with me, you know, moving out of the pandemic. It's like, well, if I didn't, uh, you know, this kind of forced me to not just unthinkingly do all these things without, you know, seeing how they tied into what I was actually trying to accomplish. Um, now, uh, let's try to keep the best parts of that moving out of the, moving out of the, you know, kind of fully locked down form of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a there's an obvious question. I think it's obvious anyways, that's sort of hanging out there for us, Lydie. If you were gonna write subtract over again, what would you subtract from it? I would uh what would I subtract from it? I I mean certainly some things on the the line line level. I mean, when I read it now, I'm like, oh man, I should have spent more time on that sentence. I'm trying to think of a, a big subtraction. Um, I might subtract 
parts of the chapter three, the culture chapter. Um, I think it, uh, yeah, I think that, um, you know, so we talk about these reasons why, uh, why we don't subtract. And, you know, so I delved into the biological reasons and then delved into the, the cultural reasons. And I mean, the cultural reasons there, uh, there, there isn't really a, a clear cut, okay, this, this culture is better than this other culture at subtracting. Um, and I think that's an important point to get across, but maybe could have done it more quickly. And I think it would have, to this point about communicating the, the important things in that cultural section are that the damaging, the most damaging thing I think in terms of subtracting is thinking of it in a binary way, right? Thinking of add or subtract, right? And this is something we do. We position concepts in opposition to each other because then if one is true, then the other must be false. And then that helps with our reasoning, but it doesn't work when the concepts aren't actually in opposition to each other, right? It's like, and these are complementary <laughs> ways to make change. And so if we could just shift from thinking add or subtract to add and subtract, then when I think of adding a block, I might think, oh, well, maybe subtracting could work here. Anyway, so I think that point got buried in the kind of, as I uh, played into a little bit of this, um, okay, which culture is better than others? And there's not, you know, there's no evidence that any culture is better than the others. This is something that we we all kind of do. So I guess that would be an area I would subtract. I had also, um, yeah. I'll, I'll stop there. I was going to say some things to add, but that wasn't your question. <laughs> and that shows my, I've, yeah, yeah. I've, it's, it's the interesting that you're going, you're going to the addition part. Uh, there, that's, that's fascinating uh, with, without a doubt. So I wondered if you would share something with us too, a, a recent example of a, a really impactful thing that you subtracted from your personal life. The, I was talking to a, a friend who does, uh, who's like kind of a, a parenting work-life balance expert. And she helped me realize in a very like thoughtful way uh, and like very tactfully that some of my parenting is just like, I was doing this in my parenting, right? Basically like, okay, my two-year-old needs this, 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 and this. And then he comes a three-year-old and he needs new things and new things, but I was never subtracting the old things that he no longer needed, right? So it's like, once my seven-year-old can like kick a soccer ball 20 miles an hour, I probably don't need to be helping him put his shoes on in the morning. I think he can do that himself. And so it was like a classic example of um, something that I care a ton about. And you, you tend to think, okay, this is something that, you know, by helping I'm being, I'm helpful, <laughs> but actually you're kind of, uh, overwhelming yourself, but also making it so that they don't ha have their, uh, you know, don't develop their independence as quickly. So I think the the parenting and, you know, being really conscious of this in my parenting, uh, I was, the, my two kids were playing with each other the other night and I was like getting ready to come in and read or something. And it's like, no, this is perfect. These, they're like interacting with each other and have it, both having a great experience and just leave myself out of the situation. And, um, and it will be better. So that's an area when I've been applying it. I also think it brings up a point we haven't touched on, if you let me, is that one of the, <clears throat> oftentimes when we subtract something, it allows the humans to do something else, right? It, it, it allows the humans that we're trying to serve, whether they're our customers or our kids or students, um, to do more, which which they actually enjoy. Um, and so I think that that's something to keep in mind that just because you're, you're asking more of your customer, it doesn't mean that's bad. It could be, that could be like the thing that actually they want and, and makes it a better experience for them. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really, that's a really practical example. And, and I, there's a lot of parallels with that personal parenting example about, about tying the shoes or not, because as managers, we do that all the time. And I, and I think yeah. it's worth taking note of where in our organizations are we tying our employees' shoes when we no longer have to. Well, we had, a, we had a, a, a lead from the heart uh, author, Mark Crowley on Unleashed uh, back, in season, uh, back in season two. And he had this really awesome analogy that's always stuck with me. And it's that if you wanna be a leader, you have to stop shooting free throws for your people. And I just thought that's really stuck with me because I think about all the times now where I step in and I'm like, hey, you know, st step aside, let me, sh I'll shoot this shot for you. And that's not my role. It's my role to teach them how to shoot effective three throws, not shoot them for them. So that tying the shoe analogy uh, reminds me of that a lot, uh, a lot, Lighty. Yeah, I think, um, and when you realize that 
people can do that, it leads to some of the most effective innovations. And, you know, one of my favorite subtractive examples is the balance bike, right? So these are the bikes that subtracted the, the pedals. And, uh, you know, all this innovation that happened over the years in bikes, and it's only relatively recently that somebody thought, oh, if we subtract the pedals, then a little kid can propel it like a Flintstone car. But, oh, it turns out also that little two-year-olds can balance on this thing and, and make that work. And so by by really considering the the capabilities of the people that you're trying to serve, you that might reveal some things that could be subtracted. Yeah, uh, Lottie, I've got a two-part question for you here. In in your writing, it becomes it becomes really clear really quickly that uh, you're as interested or more in trying to help the world solve some of its most important social issues as you are science. And um, my first part of the question is, uh, how did you become so keenly interested in trying to make the world a better place? I, I guess my parents, I'm sure my parents, <laughs> my dad's a retired botany professor and uh, my, uh, my mom went to college in Vermont in the 70s. So I, and so like that environmental ethic was strong in our, in our household and like, Again, I don't, you know, I don't particularly, I love being outside, but I'm not one of these, you know, kind of tree hugger, care, care for the environment just for the environment's sake. Although I think that I aspire to do that. Um, but, but just, I understood from a very young age how interconnected the physical, the natural and physical environment are with human well being, right? And um, to have a thriving society, to have a thriving economy, that requires having a thriving planet. And so that's, always been a social issue that I cared about, but also just cared about it because it, it has such an effect on humans. And as you're seeing now, I mean, it's, you know, has it especially has an effect on the, the people who um, kind of have the least buffer to deal with it. So I would say I got interested in the science because of the social issues. So it's like, how do you, okay, there's this problem of you know, adding, 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 and that is kind of like pushing us beyond planetary boundaries, whether that's climate change, where we have more parts per million in the atmosphere than scientists think is safe, or some, you know, even like plastic pollution. It's like we can't add our way out of these same problems. And subtracting is a way to continue making progress, because I, you know, I, I'm an engineer, I like, I'm like most of the things about capitalism, I mean, to continue making progress, but not push ourselves up against these, these planetary boundaries, subtracting is an option. And so that's, you know, that's how kind of I came to this question. I mean, the, the bridge example was an epiphany of like the fundamental thinking process, but I'd always been interested in these, you know, kind of larger examples of, hey, they remove a highway in a city and all of a sudden the city functions better and you're reducing the amount of emissions from, from vehicles. So uh, so that's how I got interested in the, in the, in the social issues. And well, I've always been interested in the social issues and they actually brought me to the science, which I think is why the science is interdisciplinary because I don't really care what discipline it's from. I care what social issue it applies to. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great answer, Laddie. And I, and I applaud you. Uh, I applaud you for that work. And you answered the second part of the question without me having to ask it. So, so, so thanks for elaborating okay. on it. That was a, that was a wonderful answer. Uh, Lydie, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and this brings us to the point uh, at the conclusion of the conversation where we'd like to bring up three and 30. So I know you've prepared uh, three simple tips that listeners can take in the next 30 days to start applying more of a subtraction mindset. So I wonder if you could, you could speak to those three points. Yeah, I think we might have hit them already, too. Uh, so that was awesome, uh, awesome job interviewing. The uh, making subtraction part of your process, right? That's something you can do right now. Um, some things that I do is set aside regular time to consider stop doings, stop thinkings, stop buyings. I think the the rules fit in there too. Are there rules that you can put in place? And you know, you're the ones who know your 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 own the the important decision making points in your lives. Um, and so think about how you can make this part of your regular process. Uh, have your meetings. We talked about that one and, and Bob might have more on that one in two weeks, but, uh, you know, try having the frequency, the participants and the, and the time and see what happens. You can always add it back, um, <laughs> after 30 days, if it's not working and then share your subtractions, right? So this, again, we talked about that noticeability problem where if you subtract something, it's not obvious, uh, 
So when you subtract a meeting, make sure that you, you explain to people why you subtracted a meeting and remind people, my, and remind people when, when they have that free time that you subtracted the meeting from that, hey, like this time is because we aren't having that meeting. Um, and then the last one is, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and, and remind your future self, like Sophie, with putting this reminder on our calendar of this time brought to you by the subtraction. Didn't quite get it in 30 seconds, but there they are. No, love that. And you don't have to do it in 30 seconds, but uh, that's awesome. Oh, 30 that's days, really three and 30 days. Yeah, sorry. They get 30 days to do these. Yeah, not 30. We're really subtracting if we're going to give them 30 seconds to do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I, I had to laugh. Uh, you might want to take cookies uh, with you if you're going to go into your manager's office and suggest that they, uh, that, 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 uh, that they half the meeting time. So, uh, but great, uh, great practical tips. And you can stay connected with us through our favorite social platforms. So you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, of course. You can also find us on, on LinkedIn and the YouTube channel uh, at Unleash Results. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel. You can find today's episode and all of the previous episodes by going to our website at unleashresults.com. Lydie, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you today. I've really enjoyed our interactions leading up to this. And uh, you've been so gracious in accommodating us on scheduling and, and, uh, and uh, finally getting this appearance in the book. So thank you so much for being here today. Where can people find you? Uh, the book is the best stuff. Um, and I have a good Google name too. I I'm on Twitter, but I'm not, uh, I'm not spending as much time writing profound stuff as Adam Grant. So, uh, those are, those are the main places and you can get the book anywhere, anywhere books are sold. Yeah. And thank you, That's Jeff. Awesome. I mean, I, like I said before, I think, uh, as a scientist, like sharing the stuff that we find out with influential people making real change in the real world is, is just priceless. And so I, I, very much appreciate your role in making that happen and then of course the audience taking these ideas and 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 making them real uh, absolutely our pleasure uh, uh very much thanks uh, thanks so much lighty thanks for tuning in now if you found today's conversation helpful don't forget to share it with your friends and colleagues who like learning as much as you do and if you're a leader of a business and you're ready to take the next step because you know there's unleashed potential that exists within it don't wait another minute Go to UnleashResults.com and subscribe to our newsletter. We'll take care of the rest.